right. I uh, hope you can all hear me. Welcome to this presentation. So my name is Eric Osterlund, and I'm um, one of the garbage collection engineers in the Java platform group from Oracle. And today I'm going to talk about the Z garbage collector. It's a new scalable low latency garbage collector introduced in JDK 11. Um, so first I have to give you this uh, safe harbor statement that basically you can't trust anything I say, but if you do have concerns about that, everything I'm coding is open source, so you can go and check out the code, because code doesn't lie. Um, so this is the agenda for today. I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction what ZGC is all about, and take a quick peek under the hood into some implementation details, look at some performance numbers and talk about how to use ZGC as well as what our future plans are with this garbage collector. So uh, what is uh, ZGC? Um, well, as I said, it's a new garbage collector introduced in uh, JDK 11 and it's currently an experimental feature. So you should probably not run it in your um, production workloads and it's working on Linux x86-64 only. Um, so, the main goal, as I said, is to have a scalable, low latency garbage collector. And when I say scalable, now what I mean, what do I mean about, what do I mean with that? Um, and to give you an answer to that, it's best to look at the goals with our project. So, um, we are aiming at uh, being able to run workloads with multi-terabyte heaps and still maintain GC pause times no longer than maximum 10 milliseconds. And for this, we're not willing to pay uh, more than 15% throughput overhead. In practice, it turns out that, well, these were the goals we set up. Um, we perform typically uh, a lot better, both in terms of throughput and um, pause times. And another goal, that should not be understated that we take very seriously is we want this garbage collector to be as easy as possible to tune. We don't want 500 JVM flags that nobody understands what to do with them. When as few as we humanly can have. Um, yeah. And at a glance, uh, ZGC is a concurrent tracing and compacting garbage collector. Um, so it will mark all your objects from the roots and do the transitive closure with that and do defragmentation and free up contiguous regions of memory so that you can do bump pointer allocation very efficiently. And currently it is a single generation garbage collector. This has pros and cons. More often it has cons than it has pros, which is why we are looking into adding a young generation to ZGC, but as of today, we do not have it yet. Um, so it is region-based, and in the case of ZGC, we are reserving a four terabyte large virtual address space, and we are allocating um, granularity of two megabyte regions inside of this, this space. Um, and it is NumaWare, so when you allocate objects from a thread, we'll try and give you memory locally to that node so that you can scale your workloads to larger machines without um, overheads. And to make all this concurrent magic happen, we are relying heavily on load barriers and color pointers. And what that means, uh, we'll look into a bit more in detail in a, in a moment. So the main point we're trying to get across is that in, with ZGC, the pause times do not scale at all with the, large, with the size of your heap or the live set. Instead, it scales with the size of your root set. And now you're wondering, what is your root set? Well, there are parts of the root set that we can scan concurrently, but there are parts that we can't. And this typically comes down at the moment to the number of threads you have. So it will scale, the pause times will scale with the number of threads you have because we have to traverse the stacks. Um, so I, I keep on talking about concurrent and people are talking about concurrent garbage collectors. Um, what is a concurrent garbage collector? Um, 
Well, there are many different operations in garbage collectors that have to be done. And traditionally, when people talk about concurrent garbage collectors, they're talking typically about marking. So let's go through this list of the different operations that we have to perform. So primarily there is marking. We have to traverse the object graph to figure out what is live and what isn't. And there are really two aspects to marking. Um, traditionally, you think about following strongly re uh, strong references, but we also have to follow finalizers and yeah. That is typically classed as reference processing, but it's a traversal that is not bounded nevertheless. Um, and we have relocation and compaction. This is where we both defragment the memory and at the same time uh, make sure we can have very efficient bone pointer allocations that require contiguous memory to be freed. And in the reference processing, well, we deal with all the weak, soft, and phantom references and whatnot. Um, and the relocation set selection, based on the liveness information of the marking, we try and figure out where is the best bang for the buck to perform uh, compaction. And if you're using a lot of string intern, you'll find yourself getting a very large string table. This string table also needs to be cleaned up. And if you're using J and I uh, with the J weeks and uh, J objects, global, global um, J and I handles and weak handles, well, those need to be cleaned up as well. And then there is class unloading. Um, when classes die, there's a whole bunch of metadata that needs to be uh, cleaned out, partially machine code and class later class loaded data graph and all sort of things. And then naturally, there's also thread stack scanning. So let's look at our two stereotypical stop the world collectors. Um, well, you see, everything is basically done in a safe point. Um, no surprises. And you look at CMS and G1, then we can see that marking is done concurrently. Uh, or I should say marking of strong references in the old generation is done concurrently. Uh, the and everything reachable from finalizers as well as things in the young generation are still traced in a safe point. So um, with ZGC, um, we are aiming at doing pretty much everything concurrently because why not? And um, the only thing that we are currently in the ZGC development repository not doing um, concurrently is thread stack scanning. And I think we have some ideas about what to do with that. In JDK 11, though, the release we made in JDK 11 still doesn't have global ref scanning or class unloading being done concurrently. So now let's have a peek under the hood to see how, how could we possibly do all this crazy stuff. Um, so GC faces. They look something like this. This is a slight simplification of the truth, but it's the version of the truth that is easier to explain. Uh, the uh, vertical arrows are save point operations, and the horizontal arrows are concurrent execution. And we start a GC cycle with uh, mark start, and we there traverse the stacks and figure out the routes from the stacks. Then we start running concurrently immediately, and walk the object graph, as well as the set of routes that we can move out of save points, which is quite a few. Um, when we terminate marking, we do so still in a save point, but we don't really do much at all in this save point. We just keep on running and move on to the next phase where we're doing concurrent reference processing, weak root cleaning, and relocation set selection, and nowadays even class unloading. Um, and finally, we need to start the relocation once we have selected our relocation set, and we do that in a save point. And then we start copying all the objects and perform the relocation. And when the relocation is done, we can immediately free the memory um, that we moved out of the regions. 
I won't go into too much detail how that's possible, but it is. And remember the goal we had? 10 milliseconds save, save point times at most. And this is, yeah, for each one of these save points, the aim is to have less than 10 millisecond pauses. Typically, it's a lot better than that. So the, the core of this algorithm, I suppose, to achieve this is colored pointers. Um, the idea is that we're using 64-bit pointers. And in these 64-bit pointers, uh, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, bits that are not being used. So we put in our metadata in those bits. And that way, for each different GC phase, we can know which pointers are out of sync and lazily perform <laughs> operations that would otherwise have to be done inside of save points. Due to this, this inherent use of 64-bit pointers, we do not support 32-bit platforms by design, and we do not support compressed loops, which seemed like a reasonable trade-off for a GC aiming to be scalable. And to, yeah, to detect wrong things with these colored pointers, we use something called load barriers. Um, and now you're wondering, Barry, what is the barrier anyway? Um, and a barrier is a small piece of machine code that we insert into logical operations from your Java applications, such as loads and stores. Almost all collectors use write barriers to do their upkeeping, uh, book, bookkeeping, I should say. Uh, but in ZGC, we use load barriers. And in these load barriers, we can check if the pointers have the wrong color. And if they have the wrong color, we can basically paint them the right color and stick them back in and fix them up and take whatever action required to fix up this color. Kind of abstract way of putting it. Uh, so let's, let's take an example here. Let's say you have a person class. And this person, it has a name, which is a string. It has a few primitive values. It's uh, an age and a, and a height. When we load this name field, we're performing a heap access, a heap load. And that is where we need to put in a load barrier. So what happens if we create new local variables and assign them to, to this name? Well, that that's not a heap access. It's not a heap load. So we don't need any load barriers there. And if we're calling a method, well, again, there is no heap access, so we don't need any barriers there. And if you read these primitive values like the age, well, once again, there is no there is well there is no reference load from the heap. Therefore, there are no pointers with the wrong colors going on here. So. We don't need any barriers there either. So if we zoom in to one of these load barriers, can give you a bit of a, an abstract um, pseudocode, if you will, what we're doing in these barriers. And it's a very, very easy um, bit, bit matching operation, where we perform a bitwise add between the pointer and a thread local mask that is very easily accessible and check if it's not zero. In that case, we take a slow path to fix up this pointer using the address of the field and the value of the uh, pointer that we loaded. And uh, the frequency of the slow path is very low. So that makes this branch very predictable. And in fact, if we look at the uh, generated machine code for these load barriers, it looks something like this. There's a test and branch. And the test using R15 is a thread. Uh, basically, the, um, the thread is stored in the register. And from there, we can very easily, with a memory operand, access the, the uh, mask. So two instructions for the load barrier. Uh, traditionally, in some literature, literature, you have been told that 
load barriers are very expensive and branches are particularly expensive and if you use them your computer will blow up and you will not have a very happy day. Uh, it turns out though that with today's speculative execution these well predicted branches well the hardware deals with them very well so in practice the overhead of this this check in the spec jbb 2015 benchmark was measured to be roughly four percent and write barriers aren't free either so speaking of performance let's have a look at some more details so These, this is a comparison between ZGC, Parallel, and G1 using SpectreB 2015. And the dark blue color is the max JOPS, and the light blue color is critical JOPS. So basically, the max JOPS is measuring the, uh, the performance, the max performance you can get out of this without considering latency at all. Whereas critical JOPS is a rather obscure metric where basically you can say that if you care about latency, this is what you should be looking at. And as you can see at the moment, at least in this measurement with 128 gigabyte heap and a dual socket into the machine, um, in terms of max JOPS, we're very close to each other. Uh, but in terms of critical JOPS, there is a huge difference that ZGC has 50% better uh, throughput and parallel, and 29% better than G1 in terms of critical JOPS. And if you look at the pause times, that's where it gets really interesting. Um, so uh, the the average is a light blue color, and the max is the uh, black color. And in between there, we have random different percentiles. And you're wondering, where is ZGC? I can't see it. At least that's what I wonder. And <clears throat> classic trick, uh, we need we need this uh, l l log. Um, l we need a log to see the the pause times. And now we can see see ZGC again. And if we put some numbers at this. You can see that the maximum latency of ZGC during this run was 1.96 milliseconds, so below 2 milliseconds. And if you compare that to G1 with 544 milliseconds and parallel with 306 milliseconds, basically it's looking a lot better over an order of magnitude, over, over two ma orders of magnitude better. So that looks promising to me. And remember the goal we had? 10 milliseconds. And we are performing better than that. In fact, it's, it's getting better with, now with concurrent class unloading. Um, we don't have to traverse code caches, and we don't have to traverse class loaded data uh, graphs uh, inside of save points. So it's getting even better than this. Right, so I hope I've done my sa sales talk well enough to, to sell this car to you. So how about how do we use this thing? The main thing to remember you got to do to use ZGC is to use the use ZGC flag. Um, and since it's a, currently an experimental option in JDK 11, you'll also need to unlock experimental VM options. Um, in terms of tuning, we've tried to make this really as simple as it can be. And in terms of the different operations we're performing, we are not exposing any flags for tuning those operations. Um, but the, what you might run into, the whole thing that tuning of a concurrent collector all revolves around is how to avoid allocation stalls. Uh, so basically, uh, since we are performing garbage collection while the application is running, we run into some issues you otherwise don't. Because normally, if you run out of memory, you stop the world and you you patiently wait until the GC is done and then you start running. But we instead start running immediately while we are performing garbage collection. And during that time, you keep on running a whole bunch of allocations. And you're hoping that the garbage collector will finish before you run out of memory. And, and then you can hand back a whole bulk of memory and continue running. So the main knob for, for tuning ZGC is the heap size. Uh, right. If you get an allocation stall, 
uh, because which you will see in the log if you get an allocation stall because the GC couldn't keep up, you can essentially just increase the heap size until it stops bothering you. Um, however, if you don't have more memory, another option to make these allocation stalls go away is to increase the number of GC threads. So that kind of depends if you're willing to spend memory or CPU on getting rid of allocation stalls. And there's no obvious way for us to figure that out automatically because we don't really care. We don't know if you care more about memory or, or CPU. Um, having said that, we are looking into continuously improving this so that hopefully in the in most use cases you'll never have to uh, bother with them. But for the moment you do need to uh, bother with at least setting the heap size. Uh, yeah. So is that it? Yeah, that's it. Um, so in terms of logging, if, if you just can't wait to look at all the numbers and see what is going on under the hood, um, these are the recommended uh, logging options. So you have the basic and the detailed version. And yeah, the, the the basic version will give you something like this. You, every line is a GC cycle, a full GC cycle. And here we can see in this particular example that we had a GC due to allocation rate. Uh, allocation rate means that we are predicting that you are starting to run out of memory. And we think it's a good idea to perform a GC cycle so you don't get allocation stalls. And um, when we started collecting, we had 73% uh, capacity. And then after the collection, we got down uh, to 20%. So you can keep on allocating a bunch more stuff. Right. So if you look in the detailed view, you get a whole bunch more information. So for all of you out there who just love reading all the details, here we go. Um, so you can look at the different different phases of the GC and zoom into that. The lines starting with pause, they are save points. And those are the ones you should be really looking at. And you don't want those to take too long time. Uh, and the ones starting with concurrent, well, as you can guess, they are running concurrently to the Java application. Um, so in this particular example, as you can see, the three save point operations were uh, less than a millisecond, another one less than a millisecond, and one just above a millisecond. And the concurrent phases uh, mark, marking seems to be taking the longest time, 1.1 second, and relocation, 645 milliseconds. But you don't, you don't, the application doesn't need to wait for that. It just keeps on running at the same time, so it's less of a problem. And we also show this view where we can look at different um, different statistics for, for memory usage at different times in the cycle. Because all of these numbers change throughout the cycle. In a classical stop the world collector, you would have one simple point of, of measurement. But here we have multiple. And to be as transparent as possible, we are showing all of these uh, different data points. So the capacity is how much of the uh, the allowed memory the JVM is hogging. Then we have a reserve, which is the the memory that the GC is hogging um, that we have reserved for for good reasons. And then the the free is basically how much is available for allocations, and the used bit is what's not available for allocations. Then. Um, Live, that's what we, the percentage of the heap that we found it to be live, which is all, all, only known after marking has finished. And then we also figure out how much is garbage and then how much we can reclaim. In this particular example, if we look at allocated, you can see that when we start we, during mark start, we, we don't really know because we're measuring the allocation since the GC cycle has started. And as this is when we started, it's a nonsense value. Uh, once you get to mark end, we can see how much mem memory view allocating throughout the GC cycle. And similar for relocate start and relocate end. Same for the other values. 
Right. And we also have stat counters. So there's a whole bunch of counters for various things that you might be interested in. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. And if we zoom into one of these lines, for example, the allocation rate, the way to read this is you, you, you typically start looking at the right hand side to see the unit. You can see it's megabytes per second. Then for each of these columns, we are looking at different time intervals. The last 10 seconds, the last 10 minutes, the last 10 hours, and the total. And within that, you have an average and a maximum. And we're sampling all of this information. So in this particular case, we can see that the, the last 10 seconds, the allocation rate has been, on average, um, 1.4 gigabytes per second-ish and uh, 1,672 megabytes per sec second was the maximum allocation rate. And the past 10 hours, well, it's been a bit higher on average, 1,679 megabytes per second, and the maximum 7,914 megabytes per second. So this might come in useful, to, because if you get allocation installed, you want to figure out what your allocation rates are. And we also have stat counters for the, the save point operations themselves. So you can zoom into each one of these and see how it has performed over time. And in this particular case, you can see that the past 10 seconds, you know, the, the average for Mark N is 0 0.8 milliseconds, pretty good. And yeah, the, the average and maximum are the same here because there's only been one cycle the past 10 seconds. Uh, however, in the last, 10 hours, yeah, you can see it's, it's a little bit worse than it was for 10 seconds. But still, it's there around, at the worst, 2 milliseconds pause time for a relocate start. Right, so what are our future plans with this garbage collector? Um, well, there's a long-term and a short-term explanation of that, and in the short term, we are working hard on concurrent class unloading. And it is available in the development repository today, and you can go and check it out. Uh, and we are, at the moment, upstreaming this work to JDK JDK, hoping to make it available as soon as possible. And in the long run, we, we, or medium term, I should say, uh, we want to remove the experimental status. Um, but we don't want to rush that too much either, because we want to make sure that this thing is really solid before we flip that flag. Um, and with this new six months re release cycle, uh, you're always just six, six months away to the next train. So we'll see what happens there. Long term, um, we want to make this GC generational. There are multiple ideas we're throwing around, but it seems like the safest bet to go with generational because it's been very successful in the past and a whole bunch of applications are generational at the moment. So why take the risk and do anything else? So we're going to try and make a, a young collection just slapped on top of what we have. And with that, we're hoping to withstand higher allocation rates than today with lower heap overhead and CPU overheads. And we also want to go sub millisecond, because why not? Um, so the the on, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of stuff removed already, and we are very close to sub millisecond. And we have some tricks up our sleeves to make us believe that we can go sub millisecond. So yeah, I'm hoping we'll get there. And in terms of platform support. I heard somebody offering beer for making it available for Mac OS. So I'm guessing that there is some interest there to make this uh, more available on other platforms. Um, so that would be interesting with some feedback from you guys as well. If, if you have any particular platforms you want to see this garbage collector run on. And eventually we're going to have to, uh, oops, do the Grawl thing as well, and yes, our load barriers in, inside of the JIT compiler of Grawl. At the moment, we don't have that. 
And uh, we encourage you all to get involved and give us feedback. And um, if you want to follow this project, you can all join the mailing list. So you see dev at openjdk.java.net and post any questions you have. There are no stupid questions. We will try to answer all your questions. And there's also a wiki page that you can visit for a project and see if you want to get started there. It's, it's a good, good source of information to get started. And in terms of where we have the code, the bleeding edge stuff is currently in the ZGC, the ZGC repository. Use at your own risk. It's not as stable. So if you want the stable release, you should be looking in JDK, JDK. But you can all clone the code and go from there. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. So now, if there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer questions. Yes. Right. The, uh, if I heard the question right, you're asking if we have performed benchmarking on small heaps. Uh, we have. And we, so our main focus has been large heaps. And that's why we've been mostly measuring large heaps. But that doesn't mean you can't use this for small heaps. So it's, it's an excellent question that even though you don't have a multi terabyte heap, you might still not want to have all these GC pulses ruin your day. And for heaps even less than one gigabyte, it's still, you know, if you care about latency, it still performs really well. Um, but we haven't spent our focus on optimizing in that domain. And some stuff is, it is just silly things going on. Like, for example, we have a, a, a certain sampling rate where we sample whether we should start a new collection that needs to be more fine grained if you're running on really small heaps. But we haven't really bothered um, looking into the details of fixing that because it's, it's not our domain. All right. Yes? How you default, uh, uh, define default number of threads for concurrent uh, operation? Um, yeah, good question. Let's see if I remember this correctly. Uh, there's a certain fraction of the available CPUs. I don't recall exactly what the fraction is, but it, it's something that we thought seemed to be making sense in general. Um, I think it's number of available cores divided by eight, I think, something like that. So basically, you want not too many CPU threads spent on GC, because um, then you are stealing CPU from, from your application. So the ideal world, you basically hit the lowest number you possibly can and still get away with it. So, so, right. So, the simple question is, oh, sorry, the simple answer is no. There are some prototypes going on in that domain to be more flexible and start more threads concurrently. It's a little bit tricky though because we are essentially guessing what the heap residency is. And there's no way of knowing that. So there's no good way of knowing how much you should um, typically accelerate by. But you definitely know when you've, your prediction was wrong, when you're, you're saying that, well, do you, based on my prediction, by now, I should already be done. And I'm not done. So that tells me that you know something needs to be done about that. And yeah, at the moment, we are, we, there are room for improvements there. Yes? Sorry? Well, if you're not using a ridiculous number of threads, then you will probably um, go. Th yeah, they will. That's the main thing that you, your application can tune at the moment, because that's basically what we're doing. There's some silly management references as well, like 20 of them or something, but that doesn't really count. 
Um, so yeah, if you if you reduce your number of threads, then yes. But since it's proportional only to the root size, there are really few things that you can um, affect there. Yes? Uh, have you tried to benchmark your CFC against another more? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a funny question. Um, yes, of course we have. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, so there, yeah. Is the question basically which one is faster? No, which one is to use when? Sorry? Which one to use when? In, in which use case would you prefer to use ZCC and which use case would you prefer on both? Okay, uh, I see. Um, right. So I guess the politically correct answer to that question is that since these are both open open source projects, you can download both of them and try them out and see for your particular ap application when which one performs worse. And in my supervised view, of course, naturally, I think ZGC is the best always, but that, you know, that, that, that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, having said that, they have some use cases that we haven't looked into particularly much. For example, handing memory back to the OS. And uh, yeah, that's something they have looked into a lot more than we have. So if, if that's what you're doing, then I, I suppose you're better off in Shenandoah in that case. Having said that, we, we do have some prototypes doing that in ZGC as well. But it's not available right now. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for listening.